Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, my name is Hazuki Mori of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Access to Space for All series of webinars on conducting R&D in hypergravity and microgravity. Um, this is the sixth webinar of our nine webinar series, so we're halfway past the webinar series. And today we will go into physical science, especially into fluid dynamics. So before we begin, I'd like to give you some housekeeping rules. First, please make sure to turn off your cameras and your microphone. Second, please use the chat box to ask any questions. So we will have a dedicated time for Q&A at the end, but you don't have to wait until then. If you have any questions, comments, please make sure to put it in the chat box. Third, please answer our questionnaire form that we will be putting in the chat box later on. My colleague Wenbin will be very active in the chat, providing you with useful links and also the questionnaire link. So please make sure to answer the questionnaire before you leave. We would really, really love to hear your feedback on our webinars. We would want to provide you with better webinars. So we would really, um, uh, we would, we really want to hear your feedback. And last but not least, if you are on social media, please use the hashtag Access to Space for All to help us promote this webinar. We are active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at UNUSA. So I don't know how many of you have been um, participating in our past webinars, but we have been doing a whole series of webinars, as you can see here, from the end of April. The main objective of this webinar series is to really raise awareness of the many types of R&D done in hypergravity, microgravity, and to really trigger their interest in this amazing field. Through these webinars, we want to provide theoretical educational knowledge that can support hands-on opportunities, such as the um, activities under our Access to Space for All initiative, but the many other activities done um, all over the world. The learning outcomes of these webinars are one, the fundamentals, special characteristics and advantages of hypergravity and microgravity environments. Two, an overview of what type of research can be done in hypergravity and microgravity and its applications. Three, the overview of available modified gravity platforms, areas of application and benefits. So what I mean by um, overview is um, you'll be able to learn about the different types of um, platforms that you can use. For example, the drop tower or the ISS or yeah, different platforms like that. Fourth, how to develop an experiment to be conducted in hypergravity, um, microgravity. So especially in this session, we will learn about the technical aspects of fluid dynamics that you would need to know. And last but not least, the overview of the available experiment opportunities and existing networks and experts. So I'd like to emphasize that the links for all the webinars are all the same. I believe you are here because you registered, so you do not have to register more than once. Um, you can use the same links for all the webinars that are coming up. So next week, we will have a webinar dedicated to technology demonstration. After that, on June 9th, we will be introducing our UN USA opportunities that we have under the hypergravity microgravity track. And the last webinar will be inviting um, space agencies and other regional agencies um, providing us with information about their regional activities. Okay, um, this is about our webinar information. So all the updates of the webinars will be posted to our Access to Space for All initiative main website, which is the top um, link you see there. The webinar recordings and presentations will be posted to a different page, which is linked to the main page. Um, it's called the past webinars of the Access to Space for All initiative, so you can find them there. Actually, I've already put the presentations of today's speakers there, so you can um, just go to the website, um, the, uh, the past webinars for the Access to Space for All initiative page, and you'll be able to find today's speakers' presentations there. The recordings, I will upload them as soon as um, all the webinars are done for today. They will also be posted on our YouTube channel, um, UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. Okay, and just to emphasize, the Access to Space for All initiative has eight um, opportunities, as you can see here. Um, we have two currently open that I would like to promote again. Um, so first, um, the opportunity is called KiboCube, which will end at the end of this month. So you have a few more days. Um, it is an opportunity to deploy a 1U CubeSat from the International Space Station. Um, our partner is um, JAXA. So if you are interested in uh, developing a 1U CubeSat and have it deployed, please make sure to check out our KiboCube website. Uh, the second uh, opportunity to open now is called drop tests. 
um, which is under the hypergravity and microgravity track, so it might be interesting for all of you. Um, it is um, with our partners ZARM and DLR. Um, this is an opportunity to test microgravity experiments at the Bremen Drop Tower in Germany. This is open until the end of June. In our webinar on June 9th that we will be um, explaining about our UN USA opportunities, we will have a dedicated time at the end to talk about drop tests, especially um, to uh, answer your questions about any technical issues or any administrative issues that you may have when applying to the drop test round. So um, I will update the agenda um, of the webinars later, but um, we will definitely take time for drop tests. So if you're interested, um, please make sure to check the website out, look at the documents, and also send us any questions if you have any. Okay, um, for today's webinar, um, the first session we have is this morning, so 10.30 on CEST. The first professional talk will be by um, Professor Ryoji Imai of Muroran Institute of Technology and Professor Masato Mikami from Yamaguchi University. So they will be giving us a 45 minute introduction to fluid dynamics research and development. After that, we will have a student talk giving us an example of an experiment, um, and this will be done by Antonio from the Politen Politecnico de Milano. And we will have that for 15 minutes. And then after that, we will have a dedicated Q&A session. Um, just to mention, in the afternoon, we will have the same webinar um, with different speakers. The professional talk would be from um, Dr. Divya Panachitan from Axiom Space. And for the student talk, we will have um, Alvaro from the University of Colorado Boulder. OK, so now I'd like to get into the actual contents of today's webinar. So I'd like to introduce to you the first two professors of our professional talk. So um, to introduce first um, doc, um, Professor Imai, um, Dr. Imai is a professor at the Department of Mechanical, Aerospace and Material Engineering at the Muran Institute of Technology in Japan. He received a doctorate in F Faculty of Engineering Science at Osaka University in 1995. He had been belonging to the Research Institute in IHI Corporation from 1989 until 2014. During his career in, at IHI, he was in charge of research and development on fluid ma management technology in microgravity conditions, thermal problems on propulsion systems, and solving some thermal problems related to the nuclear power plants, LNG plants, and so on. His current research in interests are thermal management of cryogenic propellant, propellant management technology under microgravity conditions, and propulsion systems for an unmanned supersonic airplanes. Also, our second speaker, is Professor Mikami and Professor Masato Mikami um, from the Graduate School of Science and Technology for Innovation at Yamaguchi University. His research interests are mainly droplets, spray combustion, diesel engine combustion, and microcombustion. His ed educational background is he achieved his PhD in 1995 in the aeronautics and astronautics from the University of Tokyo, Japan. Um, his professional background has been um, working at Yamaguchi University, but also um, as pr visiting professor at Yale University. So now I'd like to give the floor to Professor Imai and Professor Mikami. Okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm Ryoji Imai uh, from uh, Murora Institute of Technology. I'm get, I'm start my presentation. So. Well, while Professor Imai shares his screen, yes. um, please make sure to write anything in the chat. So if you have any questions, um, please address them in the chat and we will collect them and answer them at the end. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to give you my presentation in this seminar. I appreciate for related persons. I'm going to start the professional talk in webinar six, uh, physical science part two, fluid dynamics. So this is the outline of my presentation. At first, I will show how uh, fluid behaves in microgravity. I will show the video by using simple capsule, a uh, drop capsule experiment. I will introduce following three examples. At first, liquid in container. Uh, this is related to the propellant tank for spacecraft. And the second, uh, flow boiling and two-phase flow. Uh, this is related to thermal management system for space station and spacecraft. 
And finally, I will talk about the、uh, Marangoni convection.、Uh, this is the surface tension induced flow and the dominant in microgravity condition. This is related to the material, a semiconductor processing. And、uh, finally, a concluding remarks. So, and how does fruit behave in microgravity? I will show you the very simple microgravity experiment. This is an experiment apparatus using small drop capsule. At the beginning, beginning, capsule is located at the bottom. It is accelerated in this area and launched. After launch, only force acting on the capsule is gravity and the drag force is very small.、Uh, therefore, microgravity condition is obtained in this capsule. We installed an、uh, egg shaped container with liquid and a small、uh, brush bear and oil timer. In the oil timer, A droplet in green and blue colors、uh, drop by the gravity. So let's see、uh, this under microgravity. So this is a、uh, acceleration area, and、uh, here starts the、uh, microgravity. The how about the、uh, liquid behavior and the、uh, container and the、uh, oil timer. And、uh, second, did you see the behavior and the liquid? And the droplet. So, so, what can we find in this experiment? At first,、uh, b e a r float、uh, because there is no、uh, weight. And how about in the、uh, liquid shape in the container? Liquid in the container becomes round.、Uh, this is due to the surface tension. And the liquid in the container climbed along the wall. This is due to the, also due to the surface tension. And the surface tension、uh, p u l l up the liquid surface. And we call、uh, this phenomena as wetting. How about oil time? A droplet does not drop and stay there、uh, because、uh, there is no weight. And if we can see,、uh, we see the droplet in oil timer、uh, carefully.、Uh, what happens?、Uh, this is a video focusing on the behavior of one droplet. At the beginning, a droplet has a deformed shape due to the acceleration in the launching. After that, we can find that the droplet gradually becomes round.、Uh, this is also due to the surface tension. So, a、uh, droplet、uh, from previous experiment, the droplet does not drop and stays. How about bubble? Bubble doesn't rise and stays also.、Uh, this picture shows the boiling bubble in 1G condition. Bubble is formed on the heated wall and goes up. In microgravity, how does boiling bubble behave? This picture shows a boiling bubble behavior in microgravity condition. From this figure, you can see the big bubble on the heated bowl. A bubble doesn't go up and are coalesced with each other. Then, a、uh, big bubble is formed and、uh, stays on the heated bowl. In this case, a heated bowl is covered with a bubble, and in worst case, a temperature a heated bowl will increase. How about natural convection? Natural convection is generated by the difference of buoyancy due to the temperature distribution. Of course, in microgravity, natural convection is very weak. However, in microgravity, another kind of、uh, convection can be seen. This is the, the, the Marangoni convection, a surface tension induced by flow. Generally, surface tension increases with decreasing temperature. If there is a temperature gradient on the free surface, as surface tension is stronger on the lower temperature portion. Therefore, the flow towards lower temperature portion is created, and this is the Marangoni convection. Marangoni comes from the Italian physicist Carlo Marangoni. So, 
And the liquid in the container are uh, related to the propellant tank for spacecraft. I will talk about the propellant tank for artificial satellite and spacecraft. The, the artificial satellite has some thrusters, uh, that is, small rocket engine, to make at altitude control. This figure shows the overview of thrusters and the propellant tank system. The propellant tank is operated in microgravity, therefore the location of liquid is unstable. For example, in worst case, the location of propellant is upside down. Therefore, the gas will be discharged instead of the propellant. To prevent this situation, the device which traps the propellant on the outlet, even in microgravity, is installed in the tank. This device is called as a propellant management device, a PMD, and this picture is an example of a PMD. So this figure shows the liquid behavior in the gap created by two pieces of plates. In microgravity, a surface tension pulls up the liquid surface and the liquid, rides, the liquid in the gap rises. This video shows the liquid rise in the wider and the narrower gap. You can see liquid rise faster in narrower gap. This implies uh, a liquid tends to gather in narrower space uh, by surface tension. So we can utilize this phenomena in propellant tank. If we uh, form narrower space uh, at the outlet, uh, we can collect the propellant uh, there uh, by the surface tension. Installing this shape of object uh, is uh, one method to realize this. We can make a narrower space here, and uh, we can uh, so, and we can call uh, this object as band. Let's see the behavior in the tank with this band. Uh, here is the tank, and uh, here is the liquid. So, in this situation, uh, the green portion is a liquid in one z condition, and the band is inserted here. Initially, the direction of gravitational acceleration is upward. So under here, microgravity, the start, ticket goes towards the bottom, go down uh, at, uh, the, uh, near the outlet. Then, ticket uh, trap as the outlet is realized uh, by the surface tension. So this mechanism, mechanism is installed in the propellant tank uh, for the artificial satellite and uh, spacecraft. So next topic, uh, flow boiling and two-phase flow. Uh, previously, I talked about the boiling. So in the future space activities, thermal management system is a key technology because there are a lot of heat sources, for example, in some electrical component in the spacecraft and the space base, and the, this heat has to be rejected, especially in the large thermal management system. Boiling two-phase flow will be utilized because boiling is a very excellent cooling method since heat of vaporization has very high value. This is uh, one example of thermal management system. This system has some components such as evaporator, uh, condenser, pump, and the liquid line, and the vapor line, and the accumulator. In the evaporator, heat was absorbed by the boiling in this uh, device. So in this device, boiling, boiling two-phase flow uh, is formed. This figure shows the structure of boiling two-phase flow in heated tube. Near the inlet, uh, there are some bulbs on the wall, and uh, these bulbs uh, coalesced and the uh, slug flow formed. Going to, uh, going to the downward, annular flow, a uh, liquid uh, film is on the wall, and the mist flow uh, flows on the center is formed. Detail of the patient and the measurement of boiling two-phase flow in the, mi in the microgravity were conducted as the JAXA's project, TPF, two-phase flow. This pro project was collaborated work by these uh, university and uh, organizations, and uh, this 
experiment was conducted ISS. Left figure shows the TPF test module, and the right figure is a test loop. In this experiment system, a heated and uh, unheated test section were prepared. In the heated test section, a trans transparent uh, heated tube uh, for the observation and the measurement of temperature, and a copper heated tube for the measurement of temperature. There are the pictures, three components of transparent heated tube, copper heated tube, and the unheated test sections. In the unheated test section, the fruit behavior was captured from the two directions uh, to obtain the 3D structure of gas liquid interface. This table shows the summary of experiment conditions. Powerful hexane was selected as the test fruit, and the inner diameter of the test tube was 4 mm. Test tube was decided in consideration of substantial effect. We in investigate the effect of mass flow rate and applied heat to test section and the liquid subcooling, uh, in other words, inlet temperature on the flow, uh, inlet temperature on the flow patterns. This video shows uh, an astronaut is equipping the TPF flight module. Total mass uh, flight module is 140 kg. However, one person could handle because of microgravity conditions. So uh, we could observe the various kinds of flow patterns. Uh, bubble flow, bubbling flow and the annular flow, the uh, slug flow were obtained and uh, we make the flow, uh, flow pattern map. In this map, uh, horizontal axis is a superficial velocity uh, in gas phase, a kind of average velocity of gas phase. And the vertical axis is a velocity in the liquid phase. This is the two uh, phase flow behavior in 1G and uh, in uh, 1G and in this uh, condition. From this movie, we can see the larger bubble uh, flow with higher velocity due to the buoyancy. And the bubble easily coalesces. In other words, Bubble, a big bubble eats the smaller bubble and get more larger. Light move movie shows the behavior under microgravity. All bubbles have almost the same velocity. So small bubbles were flowing continuously. This is very unique flow pattern. So we named continuous bubbly flow. So we are now discussing how this flow pattern is obtained in detail. For example, we are investigating about the bubble coalescent conditions. So next, I will show you the result for the transparent glass, glass tube. Upper figure shows the history of the temp low temperature. Lower temperature means higher heat transfer coefficient. These are the movie of boiling behaviors. Upper movies were in 1G condition, and the lower is microgravity. From these figures, we can see a low heat flux condition. Low heat flux condition, the flow pattern was bubbly. And the heat transfer coefficient is higher uh, under microgravity than normal gravity. The reason might be on bubble diameter. Since the detachment and the flowing bubble diameter was larger under microgravity, and the agitation by flowing bubble was enhanced. As the higher heat flux, heat transfer coefficient uh, under microgravity became lower. We are now investig investigating the effect of gravity on the heat transfer characteristics and uh, trying to understand the mechanism. The next to topic, uh, Maragoni convection. So in the producing the single crystal, a floating zone method is applied. In this method, after cylind cylindrical materials heated, uh, by the heater and melted. By pulling down slowly, uh, melt is cooling down and solidified. Then the single crystal is formed. In the microgravity, cylindrical melt, melt is maintained stable by the surface tension. Therefore, we can produce a big single crystal like this. However, during the, this process, processing, 
Marangoni convection occurs due to the temperature difference on the free surface. In the high temperature difference, Marangoni convection behaves oscillatory, then component in the material becomes heterogeneous, that is stratification formed. This figure shows the transition when temperature difference increases. Here is a cylindrical liquid bulk and a weak or liquid bridge. And this is a higher temperature plane and uh, this is a lower temperature plane. In the small temperature difference, flow is stable and uh, symmetrical. In the larger temperature difference, uh, flow has a periodical uh, variation and we call oscillatory flow. And in more larger temperature difference, uh, flow has random variation. This is a turbulent flow is okay. Microgravity experiment of Marangoni convection in liquid bridge were conducted by some researchers and research groups. This figure shows the history of Marangoni convections. These experiments were conducted by sounding rocket and space shuttle and ISS. In this experiment, uh, the effect of these uh, non-dimensional parameters was investigated. investigated. I will introduce the Marangoni convection experiment conducted in ISS. This experiment was conducted as a MACE project uh, by these university and the organizations. So, and this is a test configuration. To observe the flow field, a transparent liquid of silicon oil was used, and the tracer particle is inserted in the liquid and the 3D movement of each tracer was captured by three uh, video cameras to obtain the three-dimensional flow structures. And by using IR camera, a uh, history of temperature field on the uh, liquid surface was uh, also measured. Left move is a movement of the tracer particle in the liquid bridge. By tracing these particles, a streamline was obtained like this. Bottom uh, movie shows the particle accumulation structures. This is called PAS pass. This phenomenon has been investigated by many researchers. So experimental result uh, conducted in ISS was summarized as uh, uh, this transition diagram. This figure shows a plantar number. A high plantar number means a uh, uh, high viscosity and a low uh, thermal conductivity. Low plantar number means a uh, high uh, thermal conductivity, uh, low uh, viscosity. So that's a plantar number versus critical marang number. A critical marang number means from steady to the 3D steady and oscillatory and the turbulent. From this figure, a critical marang number increases with plantar number. So uh, this is concluding remarks. As a fluid dynamics and a microgravity, following three examples were introduced. As they are following subject, which I could not present today, and the complex fluid, interfacial phenomena, capillary flow phenomena, colloid and the su uh, suspension, uh, suspensions, liquid crystals, forms, uh, granular materials, uh, magnet rheological fluid, polymer fluid, and the thermal and fluid dynamics related to the propulsion system in the future science. So, and finally, Fluid dynamics not only contribute to the progress of fluid science, uh, but also closely uh, related to the engineering. Microgravity fluid dynamics uh, is expected to develop further in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Mikami, for the introduction and also giving us examples of the different um, activities done in microgravity for fluid dynamics. I'd like to introduce Professor Mikami now. He will be giving us um, more information about combustion. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Um, it's loading right now. Yes, we see it. Okay, so may I start? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Masato Mikami from Yamaguchi University, Japan. Uh, it's a great honor uh, for me to have a lecture in this webinar. 
Today I'm going to talk about the space-based combustion experiments, group combustion, uh, which were conducted about uh, uh, Kibo on the ISS. First, I'm going to talk about the reason why I uh, conduct the microgravity research. Okay, this photograph shows the spray combustion. A fuel spray consists of tiny fuel droplets. Uh, the size is of the order of 10 micron. It's so small. So the uh, phenomena around such tiny droplets are not affected by gravity very much. But uh, it would be difficult to observe such phenomena uh, in detail. So in order to increase the spatial resolution, uh, you would use such a large droplet, like a one millimeter droplet. But uh, if you uh, burn one millimeter such a large droplet in normal gravity, the buoyancy-induced flow distorts the flame like a candle flame, so the gravity effect is significant and the phenomena becomes different. So uh, in order to reduce the gravity effect, uh, microgravity condition is often used. So microgravity is an ideal condition for the combustion research. Uh, in normal gravity, the combustion phenomena are affected by uh, buoyancy-induced flow, and the phenomena can become complicated. But in microgravity, the, uh, without buoyancy-induced flow, so the combustion phenomena are uh, become simplified. So, uh, for example, if you burn single fuel droplet in microgravity, you can see such a beautiful spherical flame around single droplet. Uh, in microgravity, even candle flame becomes uh, spherical. I think uh, this uh, spherical flame is so beautiful and always such a beautiful flame fascinates me. And uh, uh, droplet combustion in microgravity uh, give me uh, many, many findings. So that's the reason why I conduct the uh, combustion experiment in microgravity. Next, I'm going to show the outline of group combustion experiments. This is the International Space Station. The astronauts uh, conduct many uh, experiments about the space station. Uh, there is a module, this is Japanese module, European module, American module, and Russian module. Uh, the nickname of the Japanese experiment module is Kibo. Recently, uh, combustion research is hot in space. Actually, the combustion is literally hot. Uh, anyhow, uh, in, for example, in the American module Destiny, uh, about the International Space Station, uh, many uh, experiments have been conducted. And uh, in the Japanese module Kibo on the ISS, uh, two experiments have been conducted, already conducted, and three more experiments are going to be conducted. This slide shows the combustion experiments in Kibo. The first one is group combustion. Uh, principal investigator is uh, myself. Okay, this is a liquid fuel combustion experiment. The title is Elucidation of Flame Spread and Group Combustion Excitation Mechanism of Randomly Distributed Traffic Clouds. Uh, group combustion was conducted in 2017. And the next experiment, Group Combustion 2, uh, is going to be conducted in 2023. Okay, atomization. The principal investigator is uh, Professor Akira Umemura. Uh, okay, the title is a detailed validation of the new optimization concept derived from drop tower experiments aimed at developing a turbulent optimization simulator. Uh, this optimization was conducted in 2018. Okay, the next one is a flare. Uh, play, uh, this is a solid fuel combustion experiment. Principal investigator is Professor Osamu Fujita. 
And the title is a Fundamental Research on International Standard of Fire Safety in Space Base for Safety of Future Manned Mission. Uh, this flare is going to be conducted this year. The last one is L3 flame. Uh, this is a gaseous fuel combustion experiment. Uh, principal investigator is Professor Kaoru Maruta. The title is a low speed, low risk number counterflow flame. Uh, experiments for unified combustion limit uh, theory in 2022. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, this L3 frame is going to be uh, conducted in 2022. Okay, this shows the mission patch of my experiment, group combustion. Group combustion was conducted at the first combustion experiment in Kibo. And uh, group combustion was also conducted at the joint research between Japan and the US. Okay, this shows the group combustion experiment module called GSEM. Uh, this is a combustion vessel. All the combustion behavior occurs inside the combustion vessel. And the combustion behavior was taken by the digital camera and the high-speed camera. And GSM was uh, delivered and uh, launched by a Japanese rocket A2B and delivered to ISS by Konotori, Japanese transfer vehicle Konotori, in 2015. And in 2016, the rest apparatus, for example, a high-speed camera, was launched by an US SpaceX rocket and uh, delivered to ISS by Dragon Transfer Vehicle. Okay, and uh, uh, Professor Takuya Onishi assembled GSM into the chamber for the combustion experiment, uh, CCE. And uh, he installed the CCE in the work volume of the MSPR. MSPR uh, denotes uh, multi-purpose small parallel rug. Then in, on the February 17 in 2017, the first combustion experiment was conducted about Kibo. And uh, we uh, conducted 150 test conditions from February to January, uh, no, no, uh, February to July. This movie shows a typical burning behavior of randomly distributed traffic cloud. Uh, group combustion is excited through the flame spread. I'm going to explain this phenomena in detail later. The, uh, in the group combustion experiment, we studied the group combustion excitation limit. Okay, next, I'm going to explain the background of this group combustion experiment. Okay, spray combustion is utilized in uh, many combustors, such as diesel engines, jet engines, liquid rocket motors, industrial furnaces. In order to operate these uh, combustors stably, uh, group combustion should uh, be required to occur. Here, the fuel spray is surrounded by group flame. So this type of combustion is called group combustion. But the spray combustion is so complicated. So uh, as a fundamental research, uh, the combustion experiment in microgravity was first conducted in 1950s. As I explained, the, if you burn single droplet in microgravity, uh, spherical symmetric one-dimensional combustion uh, occurs. And there exists a steady state solution for this combustion system. So the single droplet combustion research gives uh, give us uh, many, many findings, but this is too simplified. On the other hand, spray combustion is too complicated. So there is a still large gap between single droplet combustion and spray combustion. So we extended uh, this type of ex experiment to the experiment of flame spreader droplet array, which was conducted in drop tower, 
to know the flame spread along the dopta ray. Then we extended this experiment to uh, this type of experiment to know the effect of local droplet interaction and uh, also the effect of flame spread direction. And finally, in 2017, we conducted the experiment of flame spread of a randomly distributed droplet cloud about the Kibo on the ISS. However, there is still a large gap between these two systems. So we introduced a question model to uh, uh, to reduce the gap between these two systems. So let me introduce the power question theory next. Okay, here uh, run, uh, many particles are distributed on the lattice. Okay, here, uh, the, uh, here a particle exists next to another particle. So this type, type of particle uh, system is called class, particle cluster. Okay, this is P is a, a occupation fraction, which is uh, the ratio of the total number of particles to the total number of the lattice point. So 26% of uh, particle exists on the lattice. Okay, if you increase occupation fraction, the cl cluster size becomes longer. And uh, in this case, the cluster reaches to the top side. And in this case, uh, the cluster reaches to all the sides. So this type of cluster is called large scale cluster. And this condition is a critical condition. So if you plot the occurrence probability of large scale cluster as a function of occupation fraction, the occurrence probability increases sharply and uh, reaches to unity. This is a case for the finite uh, size of the cluster. If you increase the uh, size of the cluster to infinity, uh, this curve becomes a step function. So if the occupation fraction less than critical occupation fraction, the uh, large scale cluster does not occur, always does not occur. But uh, over the critical occupation fraction, the large scale cluster always occurs. So according to the percolation theory, the local connection rule determines macroscopic behavior of randomly distributed particle cloud. Next, uh, we apply the percolation theory to spray combustion. This is a dilute spray. So green dot shows a droplet and the yellow circle shows a flame. So if you ignite the droplet near the bottom, in this case, only partial combustion occurs. But uh, in the dense spray, the group combustion of the class uh, occurs. So uh, according to the percolation theory, we can say a local flame spread rule determines macroscopic group combustion behavior of randomly distributed droplet cloud. So the local flame spread rule is important to know the group combustion behavior. This shows the simplest percolation model of flame spread in randomly distributed droplet cloud, considering flame spread limit distance. <clears throat> okay, so th if you burn one droplet, oh, sorry, <clears throat> there must be a flame spread limit around one burning droplet. So if the droplet exists inside the flame spread limit, flame can spread to this droplet. But uh, flame cannot spread to the droplet outside, existing outside the flame spread limit distance. Uh, this is a simple, a simplest power question model, simplest uh, connection rule. So using this power question model, we calculated the flame spread in randomly distributed droplet cloud. <clears throat> this is the case for the dilute spray. So the droplet spacing is large. Uh, only partial combustion occurs. But in the dense spray, the flame spreads in the straight direction. I like this critical condition. <clears throat> uh, in this critical condition, flame spread behavior becomes very complicated. 
the frame spread in very complicated paths like a zigzag uh, route. Okay, and uh, the frame uh, spread time becomes the maximum. So as I uh, explained, the, here the local flame spread rule uh, determines the macroscopic group combustion behavior. So the local sp spread rule is uh, important to know. <clears throat> I'm gon going to explain the group combustion board keyboard on the ISS. So the flame spread experiment group combustion board keyboard studied local flame spread rule and the group combustion behavior. Uh, we uh, use two types of experiment. The first type of experiment use droplet cloud element consisting of five droplets to study local flame spread rule. And second type of experiment use a randomly distributed droplet cloud with about 100 droplets to check roof combustion behavior and local flame spread behavior. So today I'm, I will show the results for the second type of experiment. <coughs> uh, this view graph shows a droplet typical droplet arrangement in group combustion. Uh, black dot uh, droplets. So we uh, changed the number of droplets from 67 to 152. And we uh, vary the initial droplet diameter from 0.9 to 1.2 millimeter. <clears throat> the normal decaying droplet of one millimeter, about one millimeter droplet are tethered at the intersection of 14 micron SIC fiber lattice. I hope you can see 14 micron SIC fiber lattice through this uh, image. And uh, one droplet are ignited to start a flame spread. So this movie shows the uh, the case for the number of droplets of 152 and the initial droplet diameter of one, about one millimeter. I hope you like this movie. Uh, group combustion is excited through flame spread. Okay, this is for the case of the number of droplets 102. And uh, okay, this movie shows the case for the number of droplets of 97. You can see a little bit complicated uh, group combustion excitation through flame spread. <clears throat> Next, uh, in order to know the group combustion excitation limit, uh, we reduce the number of droplets down to 67, and also we reduce each droplet diameter down to 0.9 millimeter. So in this case, only partial combustion was observed. So this is the case outside the group combustion excitation limit, GCEL. So there must be the group combustion excitation limit, GCEL, between these two conditions. We increase the uh, initial droplet diameter a little bit to one millimeter for the same droplet arrangement. So this is uh, uh, the case near the group combustion excitation limit. You can see a complicated frame spread. And also you can see a large scale ignition. This is a unexpected anomalous combustion, okay? can see a large scale ignition here. Oh. And uh, this is, uh, this showed uh, another anomalous combustion behavior. We call this a slow flame propagation in burned area. Okay, this center area, uh, flame uh, passes the center area. So this is burned area, but flame propagation occurs. So this is anomalous, another anomalous combustion. In summary, <clears throat> uh, we successfully conducted group combustion experiments about the keyboard on the ISS. Uh, group combustion is excited through flame spread. And the flame spread behavior is sensitive to the initial condition uh, near the around the uh, group combustion excitation limit. 
uh, we also observed uh, unexpected anomalous phenomena around near the group combustion excitation limit. This is the future research plan. Uh, group combustion 2 is going to be conducted in 2023. The, uh, we have the hypothesis that the anomalous combustion phenomena uh, are affected by the cool flame. So this, this visible flame is called hot flame. Uh, cool flame, the temperature cool flame is uh, a bit lower than hot flame, and the cool flame is uh, invisible. So we're going to study uh, the role of cool flame in the normal combustion phenomena in group combustion too. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Mikami, for this really interesting and beautiful presentation. It's really interesting to see that there is a gap between single droplets and spray combustions, and you're working first in drop towers and then to the ISS, so really gradually um, stepping um, towards the goal. So thank you so much for this really um, interesting yeah, explanation. Okay, now I'd like to go to our student speaker, who is Antonio. Antonio is a space engineer, um, passionate about science, space systems, and business. He was the project manager of our UNUSA drop test um, winning team from 2019. So I'd like to give the floor to Antonio. Uh, thank you, Asuki, uh, for inviting me to present my, my work here. Um, okay, you can see the, the full screen. Um, Maybe one moment. Yep. Uh, While Antonio is sharing his screen, um, if you have any questions to our speakers from before, our professional speakers, and to our student speaker, please make sure to put it in the chat. I only see one question at the moment, so um, please make sure to use this opportunity to ask the professionals. So I see it in full screen, beautiful. So I'll give the floor back to you, Antonio. Okay. So I'm Antonio Garcia, uh, an aeronautical and space engineer. Um, I've been investigating the ferrofluids loss in microgravity in the, within the UNOSA drop test program. I'm going to share my experience with you. But first of all, how it is uh, started everything. I'm from a little town in the south of Spain. Uh, and I moved to Sevilla to, to study the space engineering, aeronautical engineering. Uh, I become passionate of, about uh, space industry. I'm very curious about uh, space exploration, but uh, in Spain we don't have uh, we have limited access to space industry. So I decided to go for Erasmus Plus uh, fellowship. Uh, I enrolled in a space engineering master in Politecnico de Milan, and there I meet people from a space uh, propulsion laboratory, and they uh, asked me to, to join them for a microgravity experiment related with uh, ferrofluids and uh, slossing in microgravity. But uh, what is slossing? What is ferrofluids? It was, uh, this concept was very great for me. So first of all, uh, let's see what is uh, uh, this. Liquid slossing is the chaotic movement uh, of liquids inside tanks. Um, in gravity, in microgravity environment, this movement can be unpredictable, sometimes unstable. As uh, the professor Ime has told before, if you want to have some devices to control this uh, liquid propellant inside tax, you need the uh, control management uh, devices that sometimes they are very heavy or they are very complex and uh, they occupy a lot of space in the spacecraft. Uh, this phenomena can produce that uh, can compromise the space mission as uh, in the past some space missions have been compromised. This is a case of uh, Intelsat, near some maker or gravity proof uh, missions. So uh, what happened if we uh, can manage to have a, a alternative force that simulate the, the gravity force in, in the space. Well, if we manage this, uh, maybe we have a movement which is more predictable, more stable, and um, maybe we can uh, avoid these uh, heavy control devices or even uh, replace them by other things. 
Uh, this was the idea uh, that motivated a previous experiment. Uh, the idea was to have a, a liquid, uh, a magnetic liquid uh, with uh, magnetic properties and then subjected, it is subjected to a magnetic field and the microgravity then the, it feels the magnetic force simulating the, the gravity force in the space. Uh, there was a previous experiment, they moved the liquid uh, up and down uh, to see the behavior and study the behavior and they get some conclusions. However, the, there were some discrepancies in the frequency and, and in the result they got. So uh, it was needed more experimentation and also uh, uh, to, to further uh, explain the behavior we wanted also to to experiment uh, the liquids in another movement like laterally. So this was the, the motivation that uh, we went for the for the UNOSA project. And uh, we finally got for the UNOSA drop test uh, program. Uh, we were supposed to develop a, a microgravity experiment to launch in the Thantos Tower. This is the top level uh, microgravity facility on ground on the Earth. It provides from 4.5 to 99.3 seconds in microgravity with a very microgravity uh, condition, good conditions, and also it is uh, uh, low cost in comparison with another alternative to, to this kind of experimentation. So we made a, an international team. Uh, we were four, four students uh, from Spain, France, and Italy. Uh, we were very uh, we. We were based in Politecnico de Milan and uh, the uh, Space Propulsion Laboratory, and then we we were uh, starting uh, to building our experiment. We wanted the the liquid to move laterally during the launch, but it, it was uh, this is not an easy task. Uh, this is a very complex, and then we have to develop a complete experiment setup to to accomplish with the scientific requirements of our experiment. Also, we have to accomplish with the technical requirements of the experiment on the of the drop tower uh, center. So we designed this uh, experiment setup, which is composed by different subsystems. For example, we have the actuation subsystem, which is in charge of moving the, the containers of the liquids laterally. We have the detection subsystem, which is in charge of recording all the metrics and all the on uh, the surface um, and the liquid during the launch, and we have the magnetic system that is in charge of providing the, the magnetic field uh, to the liquid. Um, this was a, a, a very uh, hard work uh, that we had to do. Uh, we had the opportunity to put in practice a lot of things that we had learned uh, during university, but also to learn about new things. For example, myself, I learned about uh, Arduino electronics uh, to provide the uh, to engine the, the actuation system, also to to program all the sensors uh, which uh, compose the detection system. I also learned about uh, modeling 3D programs to design uh, the structure and also the detection head, which is uh, the one you can see in the in the right top. And also, I learned how to print in a 3D printer to, to have the experiment finally. Meanwhile, we were uh, developing this experiment. We also had a, a good uh, public impact. Uh, we appear and we share our work in different newspapers in Spain and also in different social media uh, accounts uh, in France and Italy. Uh, we also had the opportunity to assist uh, to some conference to explain our work. I had the opportunity to to go into to Granada, to the Elgra Symposium and General Assembly. Uh, this was sponsored by Ilgra, Silgra, and the ISA. Ilgra is the European uh, Low Gravity Research Association, and Silgra is the student section of the uh, association. And uh, we had the opportunity here not only to share our work but also to meet uh, people, great professionals from, from this world. Uh, it was very curious because it was not only related with fluidodynamics, but also with uh, medicine, biological aspects, and so on. Um, 
uh, uh, I met a guy, for example, that was investigating and was researching about the effects of music, which kind of music, listen the the astronaut and how it impacts to the stress levels and so on. It was very interesting. Um, and then uh, after one year, we had our experiment uh, finished. So we went to, to Bremen, to the third drop tower. We finally assembled there uh, all our, our experiment. We meet uh, the SARM engineers. They were very professional with us. They teach us a lot. And they teach us how to finally assemble and uh, launch the, the capsule. In the video, you can see how the capsule is uh, put inside the tower and then launch in the launching room. So you can imagine, or maybe not, how it is uh, after one year or, or more of working and designing your experiment, you have 9.3 seconds of microgravity. Uh, these are microgravity seconds, but there are seconds less than a minute. So we were very excited to see the, our experiment be launched in the in the control room, and um, I'm also very excited because uh, I'm worried because uh, it was subjected to uh, large loads that we cannot test before. So maybe the experiment crashed in the first uh, in the first launch. Uh, here you can see the experiment uh, itself uh, during the launch. Uh, it could have uh, crashed, but uh, if it wasn't well designed, but in fact uh, our experiment was uh, very well designed. It withstands uh, the four drops. Um, we get a lot of data of the surface to, to laterly uh, extract some conclusions. Uh, and then uh, the post campaign, we have the, this is the, uh, our capsule, the, the experiment, we have the container, inside the container we have the, the liquid, which was moving uh, during the flight. So we was uh, able to reconstruct the liquid movement during the flight and then analyze the frequencies, then align the, the movement. And then we we have analysis and uh, make some conclusion of the work, and finally we we got some publications in journals and also in conference. This is how the the work uh, concludes. Uh, if one is interested in in apply or join this kind of program, there's a, a lot of space opportunity for for students. Uh, for example, you know, so you have the job test program, the QVQ, which are now open. You have uh, competitions for youth, webinar series. Also, in Europe, you have ISA, SILGRA, and ILGRA, which offer a lot of workshop, uh, conference, sponsorship. Uh, for example, if you finish your your, uh, your study, you have the young graduate training program, etc. You also have challenges. And uh, if I have to to resume all uh, three, uh, top three uh, tips for new people starting in this field, I would say uh, this three one. The first one is explore, uh, research what is going on in the space industry late in the last uh, time, uh, see the webinars, uh, inform yourself, and then be proactive, uh, try to be curious, try to contact people, try to share impressions. Um, try to get in touch, try to, to become friends with people with same expectation that you, people that you can make a team, you can propose some ideas, may change ideas and impressions. Uh, and this is all for my, for my part. I give you here a photo of my of the family I have acquired during this program, which is the stealing team. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, don't hesitate in asking me. Thank you so much, Antonio, for this really inspiring presentation. It's really great to see that drop test has really helped your path um, through acquiring um, space technology knowledge and also um, providing a new path for you. So it's really great. Thank you so much. Thank you to you. Okay. Now I'd like to move into the questions and answers. I only see a few. So if any of you have any questions, make sure to send it to us as soon as possible so that we can um, accommodate that during the Q&A time. Okay, 
Um, so the first question is from Madhavan. Um, it is to um, the, both the professors, I believe. Um, I, I guess it's more to Professor um, Imai. What liquids can one take in space? So I know um, you explained about a lot of different um, experiments using liquid, um, liquid. But what type of liquids um, did you use in your experiments? Okay, so uh, can you hear me? Okay, and uh, I use uh, uh, two kind of uh, liquid. So the uh, experiment in the tank, uh, silicon oil was used, and uh, uh, and uh, in the Marangoni convection experiment, uh, also we uh, use the silicon oil, and uh, in the two phase flow, uh, two phase boiling flow experiment, uh, we use the power flow hexane. Uh, as a test fluid. Power flow hexane is a compound including uh, carbon and fluorine. So, are you okay? Yes, thank you so much for the answer. I hope um, that um, answers your question, Manavan. Yeah. I also see that the second question is from you and it's to Professor Mikami. I see that you have your hands raised, Professor Mikami, so maybe you can answer this. Um, he was asking about um, the temperature of the um, system that you were testing. So um, can you give us some examples of the actual temperature that it reached? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the combustion chamber, or the uh, combustion phenomena occurs inside the combustion chamber. The temperature of the combustion chamber was maintained as 20 degree centigrade. And the typical flame, so the uh, liquid fuel droplets burns inside such a 20 degree uh, centigrade atmosphere. The typical flame temperature is over 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, maybe typical temperature is 1,700 Kelvin. And uh, uh, as I explained in the future work, we like to see the cool flame. So if the we can measure the cool flame temperature, the probably temperature is around eight. Uh, 800 Kelvin or 700 Kelvin. Thank you so much, um, Professor Mikome. I think that was clear. Um, actually, these are the only two questions that I see in the question um, uh, that I see in the chat. I understand that this was a lot of information. Um, uh, the presentations are on the website. You will be able to see the recording after um, tomorrow or the next day. So if you um, have anything, please make sure um, you can send us an email as well. Oh, okay. I see a question from Chris. Um, regarding the potential use of magnetic liquids in space, um, will space weather be of concern? Um, I don't know which of the professors can answer this. Maybe Professor Imai? Regarding the potential use of magnetic liquids in space, is space weather a concern? No, no this is this is a question for me, I suppose. Uh, this is for Antonio. Yeah, I think it's for me. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Antonio, please go ahead. Uh, we were studying the magnetic liquids from the very uh, early stages of of research. Um, just to model the, the physics, uh, we, we didn't go uh, in, in this kind of consideration of the space weather yet. I mean, we are in the early stages of uh, researching. Um, we, we want to have this complete before going ahead for, for uh, further considerations. In fact, uh, uh, it, can, it can affect the space weather uh, but uh, as we have the magnetic fields uh, sources inside the spacecraft, uh, the magnetic field that creates these sources is very large uh, in comparison with the, with the other that can have uh, when the spacecraft is orbiting. And also, you, uh, you can imagine that uh, the, the magnetic field, that uh, the large magnetic field in, in which uh, all the experiment it is, uh, it is quite uh, constant 
uh, in all the, the space graph, which is very small in comparison with this uh, with this uh, magnetic field. So I think I hope that you I can uh, answer your question. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, the next question, um, we have another one from Jenny. Um, she is asking, how much did the liquid flow change depending on different, um, differing radiation levels in space? Maybe, maybe for me. <laughs> yep, um, if, any, uh, if all of you can um, write the names of the people he, who you want to ask, that would be great. But yeah, I guess, um, Professor Imai, if you can um, okay. help us with this one. Okay, it is very difficult to uh, uh, question so and uh, uh radiation in, in this case radiation is a space radiation and uh, so and uh, uh, not the heat radiation and uh, but the space radiation so i suppose so i uh, uh, we don't uh, i'm not sure the effect of the space radiation uh, on the uh, fluid behavior so i suppose uh, some kind of uh, shield uh, to the liquid, liquid uh, container. So uh, I, I'm, sure, I'm not sure the, uh, in detail the effect of space radiation on the uh, fluid behavior. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce Divya to the floor. Um, I'm going to give you more information about Divya. So Dr. Panachitan leads the business development for material and physical sciences within Axiom's space in space manufacturing and research team. She obtained her bachelor's degree from IIT Madras and her master's and PhD degrees from MIT in the field of mechanical engineering with a research focus on interfacial science. Her prior academic and industry projects include aerosol filtration for fume applications, droplet levitation using the line, light and frost effect, drag reduction using super hydrophobic hydrophobic coatings and oily water filtration using catalytic, catalytic coatings. Um, she will definitely be able to give um, a better um, introduction of herself to you. So I am going to give the floor to Dr. Divya Panachitan. Thank you, Hansuki. Um, let me first share my screen. Um, Can you, can you see the full screen mode at this point? We see it perfectly. Okay, great. Um, uh, good morning and good evening to everybody on the call. Uh, and I, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs for uh, inviting me uh, to give this webinar talk. Uh, I'll also thank um, uh, Hazuki Mori and uh, Wen Bin Sang for coordinating this. And also my co-speaker, uh, Alvero Calvo, and his colleague, uh, Elizabeth Stalberg, for introducing uh, us to uh, UNUSA. With that, I'd like to get started with the talk. Uh, and this talk is on fluid dynamics in microgravity. A little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in India, uh, in Chennai, and I did my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from uh, uh, IIT Madras. Uh, here uh, in this, I uh, during my time in my undergraduate, I got very interested in fluid mechanics and heat transfer uh, through the courses, and I did my uh, my. Uh, undergraduate project in pool boiling of nanofluids with Professor Sarit Kedas. After this, uh, I decided to pursue a PhD and master's uh, at MIT, uh, where I worked with Professor Gareth McKinley and Kripa Varanasi on a number of projects, uh, including oil water separation uh, uh, using self cleaning membranes um, and so, so super hydrophobic surfaces for drag reduction, uh, as well as uh, the light and frost effect using a uh, room temperature method. So this, uh, for those of you who are not fam familiar, the light and frost effect is just levitation of droplets using uh, uh, its own vapor or using a gas. After this, I joined um, uh, Donaldson's company uh, in Minneapolis, where I looked at 
how uh, oily particulates interact with filters, particularly in fume applications, and how can you make these filters better uh, to, um, to be able to self-clean themselves and reuse them. And then finally, I moved to Houston and joined Axiom Space, uh, where I'm uh, in the business. Uh, I'm doing this business development for physical and material science applications uh, in the in the in space research and manufacturing team. As you noticed uh, before joining Axiom Space, uh, I was mostly a, a researcher in fluid mechanics and and, uh, and uh, material science, uh, and and I hadn't worked much in microgravity. But once I learned about it, uh, microgravity research uh, and manufacturing opportunities, I realized that there is a lot of untapped uh, potential here, and uh, but there is also a lot of barriers for researchers and industry to get into this um, this arena. And that's what uh, drove me to take up this position at Axiom Space uh, in business development so I can lower those barriers for researchers like you uh, and uh, for people in the industry to to access uh, microgravity and uh, take full advantage of space to uh, to do more research. Now, getting into the content of the talk, um, I'd like to uh, uh, begin with us an interesting anecdote or story where um, this is an example of uh, of a short tower which was uh, built in in 1857, sorry, 18, uh, 1982, sorry, 1982, uh, and this is one of the early examples of how, how uh, microgravity was used uh, for manufacturing. Uh, so what was done is that there is a porous plate placed at the top of the tower and molten lead is poured into it, uh, which then generates drops of lead, uh, which fall down the tower and uh, into, into a, a pool of water. Uh, how microgravity is used here is that you, when, when it's falling down, it's in free fall, and so surface tension forces dominate and help in uh, making the shots as spherical as possible. And then also the time that it's falling, it helps in cooling the, the ball to some extent so that uh, it, it, the shape is maintained. So it's a form of containerless processing in some sense. So whether with their intention or not, they were using um, microgravity to make better lead shots. So, uh, but but more uh, interest in fluid dynamics uh, in uh, microgravity began mostly when the space race began in the 1950s. Uh, there was a lot of applications where where it was important to understand how fluids behave in microgravity. For example, in the fuel tank, uh, how the fluid. Uh, wets the the tank in in uh, uh, in Earth is very different from how it would behave in microgravity, where you can see how the fluid will just spread across the tank uh, along the surface and uh, and even wet out pores, uh, any ports that are used for ventilation or providing the fuel. So so it was very important to understand and design the fuel tanks accordingly um, with bath fills so that this problem is avoided. There were also applications uh, in combustion and the two-phase uh, heat transfer uh, during uh, 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 when they were studying uh, applications in space. So it began with that space race, but there was it has evolved a lot more now, uh, and and it has uh, it has spread across a lot of fields. Um, and this is just a subset of all the terms that you would find uh, in in fluid dynamics research in microgravity. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list; uh, it's just a, a subset of it. And you can see this um, it's there is a lot of applications of it on Earth as well. So the learnings from microgravity can be brought back to Earth and um, processes can be made better on Earth as well. So today in this talk, uh, what I want to focus on is, is not uh, what the results of the of the microgravity research is, but more on what why the uh, prince, uh, the investigators decided to use microgravity for their research. What was the reason for them to uh, to do their experiments in space and uh, and what are the applications of those experiments. So those are the uh, points that I would be focusing on today. Let's begin with one of the most commonly um, known advantage of microgravity, which is that the capillary length uh, is uh, much higher in, in microgravity. So the equation that you see on the bottom left is, is the expression for that capillary length, which is balance of both the surface tension force and the gravitational force. Um, and in Earth gravity, this length is about 
22.7 millimeters. What this means is that you can have only droplets um, it, when, when they are in this size or lower than that. If it goes above it, gravitational forces dominate and you get a puddle instead. You don't get a drop. But when you go to microgravity, you can have drops at a much larger length scale. So, so you can also have liquid bridges at a much larger length scale by the same logic. So this is what was used um, in the study to, to, to uh, understand the Marangoni con con convection. So a large liquid bridge, uh, as you can see, of 50 millimeters in diameter and six, 62 millimeters in length was created uh, with silicon oil, which is impossible to do on the Earth. And then uh, they had uh, these two the pl plates. One side was heated and one one side was kept cold. So now this uh, drives Marangoni convection. Marangoni convection is only driven by surface tension forces due to the difference in the temperatures, and uh, there is no buoyancy driven convection in space uh, due to density difference. So. So this allows them to isolate the Marangoni effect uh, uh, too, and that's not possible to do easily on Earth. So using these two um, advantages, they were able to study uh, or uh, the the uh, the behavior of Marangoni convection when you increase the temperature uh, difference between the plates. And what you see is there is initially a steady state, and then it goes into an oscillating flow. There's a, the main advantage of studying this is that uh, there is a lot of research into making crystals in space um, and using something called the float zone method, which is very similar to what is being shown here, uh, except that this silicon oil would be some molten semiconductor. And they would crystal, they would slowly solidify that semiconductor to create very pure crystals without defects. And uh, it's important to understand the uh, Marangoni effects uh, in that case. And that's that's one of the motivations to do the study. Along the same lines, uh, when you increase the when you increase the length scale of the of the drop, uh, you can also increase the time scale of uh, phenomena happening at the drop scale. So the initial uh, capillary time scale uh, denoted by this expression on the bottom left uh, is a function of the radius of the droplet. So since you can have larger droplets in space, you can also increase the time scale um, uh, of, uh, of the phenomena, such as if you are uh, having a drop bounce or you're having vibrations in the droplet, this is slowed down. So now you can observe the phenomena much more clearly which are without using uh, very high speed cameras. Right. So so the, on the right, you're seeing an, uh, a video which shows a drop which is uh, impacting a hydrophobic surface. And then you can see that contact line which is receding and then advancing and then receding. And this vibration movement can be observed more clearly in space. So this is what they used microgravity for, and uh, uh, this uh, this team, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, uh, Steen Research Group, for for studying this in microgravity. And you can see the applications of this understanding. This is uh, is on self cleaning surfaces, water harvesting devices, and anti frost coatings. And uh, you can also observe, so since you can increase the length scale of the uh, of the uh, just like you can increase the length scale of the droplets, you can also increase the length scale uh, of study of capillary uh, flow phenomena. So if you in, on Earth to have a uh, capillary flow, you need a very small uh, tubes, like right? less than a millimeter in, in diameter. But you can make those tubes bigger in space and still study the same phenomena. Here, uh, they are, what they are trying to study is uh, is how um, the uh, a drop would impregnate uh, pores uh, in in a porous uh, media uh, when it's uh, brought into contact with it, and uh, this happens very quickly on Earth. Uh, but but when you take it to space, this is slowed down, and so you can observe the wetting, um, the inertial phase as well as the viscous phase of the the wetting behavior uh, uh, much more clearly in in space. So now moving a little bit away and looking at a different advantage of microgravity. On Earth, uh, you because of the gravitational force, usually you, you design your uh, you know, fluid flow cells in the cylindrical geometry or a rectangular geometry because you have an asymmetry in the acceleration due to gravity. But in space, you don't have that. 
there is the uh, uh, every direction is the same. So you, as a result, you can study uh, convection uh, or other flow processes in the radial dimension, right? So you cannot do that easily on Earth because you would have domination uh, from uh, from the uh, in the z direction uh, or in the direction of the gravity so so here is an example where they designed a, a very intelligently designed as a, a, a way to study the geophysical flows inside the earth uh, by having this two concentric spheres uh, which rotate to simulate the rotational um, uh, forces of the earth as well as uh, there is a voltage applied between the outer cylinder and the inter inner cylinder to simulate the gravity as well uh, the thing that is missing is the z-direction gravity that you would have on Earth, which would uh, which would not uh, allow the uh, process to take place, place naturally. So this uh, this is a, a study where you can use the radial symmetry uh, to to study phenomena uh, that that need it. Another advantage of microgravity uh, is uh, is how it, it you can uh, separate the effects of agglomeration from sedimentation. So this is moving a little bit into studying complex fluids uh, or particle suspensions. So on in Earth gravity, when you have particles of different sizes, uh, you would see that there would be automatic segregation. The larger particles would go down, and the smaller particles would remain up. So this this will not happen in uh, in microgravity. Uh, all the particles would be uniformly dispersed. So now you can observe how these particles are interacting with each other without the effect of gravity. And that's something of uh, which is has applications uh, in uh, in predict for example in uh, sedimentation uh, behavior of riverbeds, uh, predicting erosion uh, and how the 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 soil uh, is formed in uh, deep water uh, hydrocarbon ex exploration. So the, all of these have um, um, some benefits of understanding this agglomeration behavior. Another uh, aspect, this is a study from my previous lab, gr um, uh, lab group at MIT, uh, where they were exploring uh, how uh, you can measure the extensional viscosity of a polymer. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges uh, they faced on Earth is that uh, the way they measure this is by, by having two, two um, uh, uh, forming a liquid bridge of the polymer and then pulling it uh, very quickly uh, apart. And you can uh, see that it forms a very thin filament, uh, which then thins out and breaks up uh, eventually. Now, studying this thinning behavior is what gives the extensional viscosity of that polymer. Um, extensional viscosity is nothing but uh, the viscosity caused due to the stretching of the polymer chains instead of the she shearing of the polymer chains. So uh, this is possible. Uh, so this, when you study uh, using this method, they observed sagging effects, and they also observed that there is a drainage of that thin filament due to gravity. Now that's uh, that's an effect that uh, is independent of why uh, of the extensional viscosity. So uh, studying this uh, in microgravity eliminates those effects. And they were uh, able to get more accurate uh, predictions of, uh, uh, sorry, not predictions, measurements of the of extensional viscosity of the polymer. And this has applications in any any place where a polymer is extruded or uh, in any way. So, for example, in making plastic bottles, and uh, blow molding, and fiber spinning, making fibers. Another example where particles, um, uh, you, uh, you know, complex fluids and particles have an advantage is that uh, you don't need to do density matching uh, to to observe phenomena. So, for example, if you need to observe large colloidal particles on Earth, you will have to typically do density matching so that they don't settle out. Uh, and in this particular case uh, where they wanted to study uh, how particles self assemble in the presence of a vibrating field as well as a temperature uh, uh, gradient um, which are applied perpendicular to each other they found through simulations that you can you can form uh, particle structures um, uh, when you do uh, apply this field but a condition for that is also that you should have the particles to ha be a different density from the liquid medium if they are the same density, then this will not work. Uh, 
So this this is why they went to microgravity to try out the experiments to prove um, their simulations. So this is an advantage that you can think of as well. Uh, I also wanted to highlight something about in space manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in, in order to um, to do uh, in space um, uh, manufacturing of space structures and uh, even using traditional manufacturing methods like brazing, welding, 3D printing. And uh, one of the things that's different in microgravity is that the way the liquid metal wet, wets the uh, solids would be very different. So studying that is important as well, uh, and also the way the the grains grow as well as the the pores, sorry, the bubbles that are created uh, behave uh, would be very different in microgravity. So there's another reason to to do microgravity studies for in space manufacturing applications. Um, pool boiling um, is uh, uh, has a very very different um, is very different in microgravity as well. So on the right, you're seeing uh, image of how boiling looks like in uh, in Earth gravity as well as in microgravity. In microgravity, you would have uh, the bubbles have no reason to detach from the surface, and uh, and uh, and so instead they would just uh, coalesce to form a single large bubble, uh, which which may or may not detach from the surface. Uh, and in case of hydrophobic surfaces, the vapor would tend to wet out the surface very easily as well. So there is some interest uh, that to study this in microgravity because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, many spacecraft systems need uh, cooling systems that use two-phase heat transfer. So, so understanding this is very important. In this graph that you see um, uh, of the heat, uh, uh, critical heat flux versus the gravitational force, you can see that when you go to lower gravity, you you get surface tension boil dominated boiling. While at higher gravity, you have uh, you have uh, bo buoyancy do dominated boiling. What is interesting about this is that um, you it's not just a lower gravity that you have surface tension uh, dominated boiling. When you go to lower length scales, uh, even in Earth gravity, you have surface tension uh, dominated boiling. So, uh, so, uh, so for example, in your phones or uh, uh, power electronics, where there is the the size of the chips are getting smaller and smaller, one of the biggest challenges they are having is how do you dissipate the heat that is created um, in these electronics. Uh, so that and uh, when you go to such small scales, it's surface tension dominated boiling that happens when you look at cooling uh, cooling these devices. So for understanding and making these processes better, it's easier to study them in microgravity because you can study this at a large, larger length scale using larger heaters, as you can see in this um, in this equation on the left. Um, to study the same thing in Earth gravity, you need to use heaters which are less than five millimeters in diameter. Uh, but but in Earth uh, in microgravity, you can go to uh, centimeters of the size of the heater. So that's an advantage that you can look at in microgravity as well. So then I wanted to uh, highlight that there is it's not just academic uh, uh, studies that are done in microgravity. There's a lot of studies done by even industry to enhance their applications and uh, apply them to their processes. So uh, one of the um, uh, studies that I want to highlight is the Delta faucet. Um, they ma they make uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, equipment for uh, restrooms, for example, and they. Uh, they, they studied how droplets are generated in microgravity to improve their shower head uh, that they're selling on the Earth. Um, the reason that they went to uh, microgravity is because the way the droplets detach from the, uh, the, the nozzle uh, is dependent um, on the gravity as well. So you, the size of the droplet is limited because of that reason. So they went to microgravity to study, hey, what is the ultimate limit of their shower head without the limitation of gravity? And then it informs them how they can uh, influence their design back on Earth or whether they can improve it uh, further. Procter & Gamble uh, is also uh, another example which used uh, microgravity to study the sedimentation behavior of gels. Um, so they, they, what they did is they had a suspension of uh, oil droplets, uh, large oil droplets in, uh, in a network of uh, small nanoparticle um, uh, su suspended in a liquid. And this 
uh, kind of system on Earth would very easily, uh, you know, separate on uh, separate out um, before they can study anything. Over here in microgravity, they were able to observe how this gel like network was able to sustain uh, and uh, how the coalescence works uh, for the different oil droplets without the effect of microgravity. They also supported another work, which is very interesting, uh, where they uh, looked at phase separation in critical fluids. Um, in uh, critical fluids are nothing uh, but it's a phase where you don't have the liquid solid or the gaseous phase dominating in, in the fluid. And this happens at a certain temperature and pressure for every fluid on Earth. Um, and this is happening at the atomic scale. Right, so it's the molecules that uh, how they are vibrating and uh, uh, crystallizing is dependent on uh, how uh, on the temperature and pressure. It's very difficult to observe that phenomena at the atomic scale on the uh, in the Earth. What they did instead is they simulated the system using colloidal particles, which have similar attractive forces as the as the um, uh, atomic uh, uh, sorry, um, as the atoms, and they were able to observe this phenomena um, uh, in microgravity. Uh, how how the particles are uh, uh, you know agglomerating with each other and forming a different phase. Uh, and they could see like gaseous phase, they could see a liquid phase, they could also see crystals formed um, over time. So this is a very, very interesting use of microgravity where you are observing an atomic scale phenomena uh, in the macro scale using a colloidal system. And this is not possible to do on the Earth uh, because these particles would just settle out. Adidas uh, is another uh, uh, example of a company where they they sent one of the uh, they sent a soccer ball to space uh, and uh, they studied how the the uh, aerodynamics of the flow around the ball um, is when they spin the when they spin the ball. So this is uh, difficult for them to do on the Earth because usually they uh, they have to constrain the ball using uh, some kind of uh, restraint um, and uh, study the flow in a wind tunnel for example so this kind of restricts the movement of the ball and uh, maybe uh, influences some in some way how the air is flowing around the ball so they used microgravity to make sure that they don't have to do too much restraining of the ball while they're studying the aerodynamics And the last example that I wanted to highlight is from Eli Lilly and Company, where they studied the dissolution of uh, tablets which are hydrophobic um, in, in water. The reason that they went to microgravity is because hydrophobic tablets would tend to uh, easily uh, float up uh, in uh, on Earth. And uh, also they, they believe that the way the wetting happens in the pores would be different in microgravity than when it is in, on Earth. And so this is the reason that they uh, did this study in microgravity to understand how the drugs dissolve into water. Uh, and also that helps in uh, designing the drugs both for Earth uh, use as well as for uh, use in space for uh, astronauts, for example. So I'll leave you again with this slide where uh, where I highlighted the different examples uh, and in and the different ways the researchers used microgravity. So usually people talk about no sedimentation, no buoyancy um, and containerless processing, but it's very, very interesting to see how you can be creative and use the microgravity environment in different ways to support your research uh, and further the understanding. So um, as um, so as uh, as as students or academics or researchers, um, I think you can look at how you, um, any of this would apply to your research, or uh, or you can also think of other ways to to utilize a microgravity. With that, I'd like to highlight uh, the, some few microgravity facilities that are available to do fluid dynamics research. So this is an example. Uh, this is a slide which highlights the uh, different ways that currently people do microgravity research. So it has um, facilities on the ground, some in the flight and some in space. 
So the main difference between them and how you should evaluate what you need for your research is looking at the duration of the uh, uninterrupted microgravity that you would have, uh, the quality of the microgravity that you would have, and whether you, you need crew, crew tending for your research. So as you can see, uh, as you go um, um, up in this uh, in this table, you see that the duration of microgravity in, uh, uh, increases. So you, in dropped hours, you get like two to ten seconds, but in space, uh, in the space station, you can get unlimited time. So depending on the phenomena you're studying, for example, a lot of combustion and drop impact studies have been done uh, uh, using drop towers in the ground because they are very quick, very fast phenomena. But if you need things like diffusion, uh, then you need to study them over multiple hours or days. Then uh, the space is where you would want to do the study. The gravitational, uh, the quality of microgravity also differs between uh, all of these uh, cases. And uh, and and one more thing that you may want to note is that depending on the location of this platform, it de uh, it determines how uh, whether you can be personally present for the experiment or whether somebody else would be uh, uh, doing this experiment for you, uh, as well as uh, the lead time uh, is also dependent on you know whether you need access to space and uh, whether you need to implement certain safety protocols for your experiment. Now, because the space station offers uh, the most advantage in all of among all of these in terms of the duration, the quality of uh, microgravity, as well as the fact that you can have crew tending through your experiment, I'm going to be focusing on this uh, for the rest of the talk. The space stations have a, a long history starting in 1973 with the Sky Lab, and then it was uh, followed by the Mir. And, uh, and recently, uh, the International Space Station has been around since 2000, uh, and it was um, a, a collaborative effort from multiple countries uh, to, to make this uh, space station possible. And they have been very successful in showing that we can have humans presence continuously in space, and this has been around for 20 years now. However, the International Space Station is uh, scheduled to be retired sometime in the near uh, future, uh, possibly within this decade. So there is a lot of talk as to what uh, will happen to uh, uh, to microgravity research that is happening on the station, and uh, uh, who would be following that. So one of uh, so Axiom Space uh, is uh, entering this, uh, where we are building the uh, first commercial space station to follow the International Space Station. This video uh, shows uh, how this would work. Uh, Axiom Space has um, secured the last port available at the International Space Station to uh, assemble their, uh, their, uh, the, their space station module by module. So what you're seeing is the first module, uh, which would mainly consist of uh, crew quarters um, and support human space flight and uh, the uh, private, pri private astronauts as well as um, government astronauts. And uh, it would also have some space for research and manufacturing. The second module also has crew quarters and uh, space for uh, research and manufacturing. And the, the third module is mainly dedicated to uh, research and manufacturing. So this, this facility would be uh, very well designed uh, for, for doing um, various types of research in, uh, from bio, biological sciences to material sciences. Um, and even the external part of the station is open for research and doing uh, different services in the low Earth orbit. The last module uh, is the power module where you uh, we, we would be um, able to provide power to the station without uh, independently without the International Space Station and uh, it would also consist of life support systems uh, to make Axiom Space Station a free, free flyer. Once this entire module is assembled, um, we we would be able to detach from the uh, in International Space Station once it is retired and become a free flyer. And let this uh, video go through. So here you can see how the the station would detach 
and you can see the the Earth Observatory, which is at the very bottom of the station, and it is the largest uh, observatory that is um, being uh, ever been constructed in space uh, for observing uh, the Earth from space. So the timeline of the station is that we uh, or the first module would be going up in 2024 and uh, uh, subsequent modules would go up um, uh, in the following years and uh, finishing the entire assembly by 2028 when Axiom Space would be uh, Axiom Station would become a uh, free flyer. Uh, up until 2024, Axiom uh, Space provides integration oppor opportunities uh, for research on the International Space Station. This is uh, the, the research and manufacturing module that I talked about in, during the video, uh, where we, uh, we, we would uh, have uh, uh, interfaces that are plug and play, that, that you won't need too much effort for integration uh, into space environment. For, for example, right now, it's, it, you have to do things specifically to be able to interface with the with the um, with the facilities on the International Space Station. We, we will make that simpler. And also um, we have crew tending and uh, state of art characterization facilities and other utilities that you need for your research. With that, I'd like to um, uh, talk about how you can get involved um, in different ways uh, in space research and manufacturing. The first way is, of course, uh, if you're a researcher, you can apply microgravity to your research or production process. So this, this is what I was talking about in, uh, in with using my examples, how different people have used microgravity to their advantage. So something that you could do is think about how microgravity would influence whatever process or whatever uh, research you're doing and see if there are potential advantages of trying this out. The second thing uh, that you uh, is if you are interested in entrepreneurship, um, uh, the space is out there for doing that. Uh, we're looking at uh, both commercial, uh, sorry, uh, academics as well as industry partners uh, who want to take advantage of the space environment to create new products and services uh, for Earth or for space. So. Uh, so, so something that you if you are interested in that there is a lot of research that has already been done in microgravity uh, that you may want to go through um, and see where there's potential uh, applications uh, in in uh, in markets on Earth. So that that's something that is uh, very actively uh, of interest uh, in today. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is uh, there's a lot of requirement for applied research as well, because there's a lot of fundamental research that is going on in microgravity, but there's a lot of need for doing applied research so that this translation to markets happens more uh, easily. So that's something that you could look into as well. If you if you are interested in and uh, to influence how um, you know what kind of topics are being pursued in microgravity and how funding is being uh, uh, dedicated to microgravity by different governments, then this is uh, you, there's all the different ways to get involved. For example, NASA is doing a decadal survey in the in the coming year, uh, seeking uh, white papers from different uh, uh, different communities of researchers to ask what they see uh, is needed uh, is the, should be the focus of the microgravity research in the next ten years. So that's something that you could get involved in. Um, you can uh, also define what kind of facilities need to be put in space. So Axiom Space. As we are building the station right now, we are seeking uh, feedback on what you think you need for your research, and uh, and we would try to accommodate that as much as possible. So that's something that uh, we are actively seeking as well. Uh, if you are an academic who works with students, then uh, the training the next generation of scientists is something that uh, is of uh, interest as well, because we need every person to think of microgravity as a ro as as a tool uh, in the toolbox to in uh, to to make new products or to study their uh, uh, their uh, to do their research. So th this is something that could be included in the curriculum to to make sure that everybody is aware of this and uh, takes advantage of this. And lastly, uh, 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 you can be involved in multiple organizations like SGSR, SEDS. Um, and uh, Selgra and of course UNUSA to 
to influence uh, or and uh, help in uh, enhancing uh, microgravity research. Axiom space uh, is uh, also um, uh, has uh, this uh, is offering this star scholarship where we are seeking uh, business and technical ideas that you would like to be uh, seeing in space. And the deadline for this is June 30th. So I encourage all the students out there uh, to 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 check out this website and uh, apply uh, with your ideas. And um, uh, we would be really, really happy to receive that and uh, award this. I'd like to leave uh, the um, uh, I'd like to conclude this talk with this slide. Uh, where uh, I have all these equations, so anybody who has worked with any kind of fluid mechanics uh, or um, in aerospace engineering or chemical engineering, you would have come across these equations in some form or the other. Uh, so, uh, and and there are a number of processes on Earth uh, um, that we that we use these equations to design uh, the processes. So the question now is if you could make the g the gravity term a variable what would happen to that process and how can we take advantage of that that is something that uh, is up to you thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the questions Thank you so much, Dr. Devia, for this really well organized presentation. It had everything it had. It began with historical experiments and then it gave us a really great overview of the fundamentals and also some really interesting commercial applications that I really didn't know. Of. So I think that was a lot of information for everybody. Um, as my colleague Wenman has put in the chat, um, her presentation is already on our website, so please make sure to check that out. Um, and really, thank you so much for this amazing um, presentation. Thank you. Okay, next I'd like to introduce our student speaker Alvaro onto the floor. Um, Alvaro, I'm sorry, Alvaro is a PhD student at the Aerospace Engineering Science at the University of Colorado Boulder, and he is the current president-elect of the ASGSR Student Society. So ASGSR has really helped us in um, selecting the speakers for these um, this whole webinar series, so I really need to thank Alvaro for that. And um, Alvaro received his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Seville, um, Spain in 2016, and his double master's degree in aeronautical and space engineering from Politecnico de Milano in 2019. His research lies at the intersection between low gravity fluid mechanics and magnetic hydrodynamics with a focus on propellant slosh control and elect electroless based ISRU. Okay, he's gonna um, explain much better, so I'm just gonna give the floor to Alvaro. We will talk about it, so don't worry. <laughs> well, hello everyone. Uh, I think you can see my screen now. Yes, you can. Kazuki, can you confirm, please? Yes, yeah, perfect. OK, great. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, for the introduction. Uh, I don't know how to start this after the wonderful presentation that DJ has prepared. I really enjoyed the, the historical sample. I was not aware of it. But well, let's start with the student part of this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Alvaro, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Colorado Boulder where I research in the field of low gravity magnetic hydrodynamics, that is the intersection between low gravity fluid mechanics and the magnetism of continuous polarizable medium. Basically what I do is try to figure out space applications uh, where we can control the movement of fluids by means of electromagnetic fields. In addition, I also work on the touchless electrostatic potential sensing of spacecraft in geo-orbit, and as Hasuki said, uh, I'm the president of a lot of ISDSR students where we interact in the work community and talk about microgravity research basically all the time. Um, before we start with the technical content, uh, I would like to just to give a glimpse of my personal experience. As Katsuki said, I studied at the University of Seville. I did there my bachelor and master in aerospace and aeronautical engineering. But actually the school of Seville is not so much a space engineering school, but a, a aeronautical engineering school, which is good. But it is not what I it is not what I really wanted to do, and I did really discover this thanks to the European Space Agency, the European Space Agency and the European Low Gravity Research Association Summer School in Red, Belgium, where I attended a two weeks uh, microgravity research course that basically disclosed all this world to me, and 
made me decide to go to Politecnico de Milano to study a master in space engineering. I want to insist on this point because this was the turning point for me in terms of research. Here at this summer school is where I decided I wanted to uh, do research in microgravity, particularly in fluid mechanics. And they uh, pushed me to, to apply to the Isaac Roger thesis 2017 program for which I was finally selected with some colleagues of mine. So this, this was actually the, the beginning for me and instead so much because it will be important for you in the, the last part of this presentation regarding uh, tips and advice for your own professional career. So what I want to do here is to present two different projects uh, related to fluid dynamics and microgravity that my colleagues and I have developed in the past year. And the first one is related uh, to magnetic liquid slushy. As DJ has said, uh, in, in low gravity we have um, that the influence of inertial forces, in particular of gravity, is negligible to do the state of continuous free fall. And that causes that the behavior of fluids is dominated by surface tension. This means that fluids behave in a way that we are not um, accustomed to here on Earth. And this is a challenge for several space applications, for, but as Deep just said perfectly, it's also an opportunity for studying a myriad of physical phenomena that we cannot study on Earth. One of those physical phenomena is low gravity liquid explosion. You know, in the 50s, when we started launching rockets to space, people was wondering, OK, we have uh, these liquid propellants and we have to control them somehow. We have to ensure that we can use them in space. And the problem is that we don't have a settling force that hits the fluid at the bottom of the tank. So the fluid behaves in very weird ways, uh, as you can see here in this figure, uh, or in the figure at the, at the right. Uh, so in order to control the position of such fluids that are dominated by surface tension, what we came up with was uh, the possibility of using propellant management devices, which are these bands that you can see here, or even thrusters to induce an inertial acceleration to settle the liquid. Uh, we do all this because we cannot do as in high gravity explosion. We cannot assume that the liquid behaves as a modal system, a linear modal system. But someone in the 60s, uh, and this someone was a NASA engineer called Steve Papel, came with an idea and he said, what if we make a liquid magnetic in such a way that we can attract it with, ma attract it with magnets and generate a kind of gravity equivalent force, magnetic gravity equivalent force in space? So he presented this patent where he uh, invented ferrofluids and his ideas, you can see, and this is kind of wonderful, it is kind of uh, archaeological engineering, right? To see that he drove himself this, uh, this concept idea I read in the 60s. And so he said, okay, let's add uh, ferromagnetic particles to the liquid and make it magnetic, and then we keep it with a, with a magnet close to the bottom of the tank, and in this way we can uh, control its position. So this idea was not feasible at the time because the magnets that we had in the systems were much weaker than those that we have nowadays with rare earths. But still, a lot of research has been uh, done recently with neodymium magnets and liquid oxygen, which is the strongest paramagnetic liquid available on Earth. And uh, this research has basically focused on the positioning of this liquid. That is, we have a, a propellant, which is magnetic and we use magnets to position the propellant at convenient places, like for instance the fuel outlet. My colleagues and I were really interested in this problem and in the implications from the fundamental science perspective of this problem. And that is why we applied and co-selected for the ESA Your Thesis 2017 and on OSA drop test 2018 programs. What we wanted to do is to study the oscillatory dynamics of this liquid here, of this magnetic liquid. So we have a cylindrical tank with a magnetic liquid, which is a ferrofluid, and we implement a series of coils and magnets to control the position. We wanted to study something that had not been studied previously, which is the oscillatory dynamics of the system. That is, how does the fluid oscillate when we apply a percussion in the presence of a, ma of a magnetic field? We made several fluid mechanics assumptions for this, develop a model, and study the equilibrium, stability, and model response in the presence of a magnetic settling force. That is, a, a magnetic force that keeps the liquid close to the bottom of the tank. But in order to validate this model, which has some uh, analytical complexity, we needed validation experiments, and that is why we applied for these programs. This is uh, this is the second uh, the Stelium program. Was, the Stelium project was the second microgravity experiment that we did. It was done as arms of tower that you can see in the video and in the figures. And here at the right, you can see our experiment that is composed as you can observe 
of two uh, cylindrical containers with a ferrofluid inside, two coils here at the bottom, and a moving platform that you will see in action in the next slide. So the idea of this system is to launch this uh, system with the inside the silence of tower, put it in 10 seconds microwave conditions, and measure the evolution of the free surface. And this is what we got. You can see here one of our launches, where we had the ferrofluid, now we are entering microgravity. In a second, you see, we'll see, you see here the lateral percussion. You see how the surface oscillates, but remains at the bottom of the tank. And it remains at the bottom of the tank because a magnetic force is, be, is being asserted by this coil here. The way we use to measure the position of the free surface is kind of interesting because it reflects why space engineering is so interesting for, for on-ground applications. We have to develop a specific surface uh, uh, detection system composed of a uh, of a laser beam and a camera, and by measuring the deformation of this laser uh, beam, we were able to uh, infer the elevation of the surface. And we actually have this in a paper that is currently under review. I, I just mentioned this because it, it is wonderful sometimes how when you try to study some problems, you came up for with solutions and technical uh, improvements for completely different setups that may be useful for other researchers. And this is something that happens a lot in microgravity research because we are subject to a strong limitations from the purely technical perspective. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot share at this point the results from this experiment because they are currently under review. But I can say, uh, as Antonio has said this morning, that the experiment was, was a great success for us in the sense that we got all the results we wanted. The experiment design was appropriate for the draft of our facility and everything worked very well. Hopefully, by the end of this year, all of our results will be published already and we will be able to share them freely in these presentations. The second project I want to talk about is more recent. It is related to diamagnetical enhanced electrolysis. As we have already discussed several times, in a space you don't have buoyancy forces. So when you try to do electrolysis of water in microgravity, you end up having these layers of bubbles uh, over the electrodes. And this is highly inconvenient because if you have a surface and you have bubbles over it, the effective surface area is reduced and you need to separate the bubbles and separate the bubbles from the water. So you need to induce phase separation. In order to do that, the most common procedure is to employ a series of pumps and control mechanisms that are basically ancillary components that increase the mass of your system. So from a purely engineering perspective, having all these systems here on board is, is highly inconvenient because if they add mass and power requirements to the system. So we were thinking about this and coming from the previous stealing experiment, one day we had this idea. You know that there is an interesting physical mechanism called diamagnetism. And diamagnetism is basically, uh, basically reflects that all the liquids that we know are magnetic up to some extent, including water. Water feels repelled from magnets, as you can see in this video. So this is a very weak buoyancy, very weak uh, volume force that can the magnets can assert. But although it is very weak in high gravity conditions, in a space, they, uh, it can become very significant. It has been used on Earth, for instance, <laughs> for making frogs levitate. And this is a very funny experiment. I think it was published in, I, I don't remember if it was Nature Communications, but I don't remember very well. But this was a very um, famous paper at the time where the researchers took a frog, which is basically a body of water, and levitated it in a strong uh, toroidal magnet uh, that is surrounding the frog right now here around. So the idea is to induce a strong magnetic force on the on the on the on the on the frog, which is made of water, and due to the diamagnetism of it, they compensate the gravity acceleration with the magnetic force, and so they can levitate different insects, the frogs, uh, and even uh, some broccoli that you will see right now. But this is on Earth, and this requires huge magnets, really huge magnets to to make this work. In a space, uh, on the contrary, uh, we don't have a mass or or power to to make this happen. So we need to to we have to be happy with what we have in terms of mass requirements. So the idea is, let's uh, add magnets to the system that are magnetic uh, uh, electrolytics. Sorry, so to the system that electrolytic cells, and let's generate a magnetic buoyancy force to attract the gas bubbles from the electrodes. We can also use this uh, buoyancy force, magnetic buoyancy force, to separate the phases, either alone, as you can see here, or combining a phase separation mechanism. We are particularly interested in these two approaches because they are a straightforward application or enhancement of existing systems. 
What we expect is to generate a magnetic buoyancy force that is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2 meters per second square. And that is a 1 to 2 order of, of magnitude larger than the force that is generated in this uh, rotary bubble of 1.25 centimeter radius. Uh, the force, the centripetal force here at the at the side is of the order of 5 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per second square. So hopefully, <laughs> the magnetic acceleration that we expect to assert in our electrolysis system should induce phase separation in a much more efficient way than you can see here in this video. But in order to validate this, we have designed a, a specific experiment that will be launched in Blue Origin's new server, thanks to the SGSR uh, Kensos Award. Uh, the purpose of this system is to validate the concept. So we have here a, a magnetic electrolytic cell composed of two proton chain membranes. This is oh sorry, this is launched in microgravity and the cells gener start generating a layer of bubbles. The idea is that we have in these two square rectangles, we have two strong neodymium magnets that attract both those bubbles and bring them to these phase separation chambers that you can see here, triangular ones, to separate the gas from the liquid. At the same time, we will observe a non-magnetic proton chain membrane to figure out what happens when we don't have the magnetic force uh, being applied to the system. This design is currently under, under development and it will be launched at some point in the future. Uh, maybe we, we can show further details in a future webinar. Now, uh, UNOSE has asked us to give uh, some tips for students that are attending this webinar and may be interested in, in pursuing a career in microgravity research. And I don't consider myself an expert or someone authorized to give advice, but I have some um, tips or some questions that I think you should ask yourself uh, for before you, you move the, to this otherwise fascinating world. And the first question that you should ask yourself is, who are you and where do you want to go? Are you a researcher? Are you someone who's interested in doing research in academia? Do you want to go to industry? Do you want to work for NASA or ESA or any other space agency? Do you want to move away from space and, I don't know, devote yourself to biological engineering or biological research? It is good that you have this in mind uh, because microbiology research is a path for many of these destinies. For instance, in the left, you can see my colleagues, Lydia and Tim from the, from the Ferros team at ESA Draw Your Thesis. Tim is currently working in oceanographic research and Lydia is a systems engineering developer in uh, related to electronics and, and electronic systems in, in skylight engineering in Seville. The experience with ESA Draw Your Thesis served to them to, to develop uh, their professional skills in the fields that they chose later, but they did not end up working in microgravity as I did. Similarly, in this right picture, you see all the components of the Stilium team, Antonio, Francesco, Ines, Filippo and me, and all our partners from UNOSA and Sarms of Tower. All of them ended up working in a space in different fields and the UNOSA uh, senior experiment was very useful for their training. If you if you realize that you want to work in microgravity, that you want to do microgravity research, you need to make a plan. But the first thing you need to do is to create your own network and reach out to your global uh, microgravity research community. And in this sense, you have ASGSR in the, in the US, but we are a, a global association. You have Selgra and Elgra, JASMA in Japan, and of course, UNOSA worldwide. And probably there are many others, but I'm not very aware of them. The thing is that when you reach out to these associations, you will not only get in touch with colleagues from your field, you will also get access to several opportunities to go hands-on, to apply your knowledge to real experiments, which is the necessary step if you want to work in microgravity. This is what really teaches you how to, how to perform. And in this case, I have to mention because this is a, a global audience uh, that is attending this webinar, that the UNOSA Access to Space for All initiative is probably the one you should look for in most cases. I really was fortunate enough to be selected to the Dross Test program, but there are many others. And these opportunities, uh, even the, if they seem kind of futuristic or not reachable for some of us, and we have all had that, that feeling that we are not maybe good enough for applying for something like this, even if you have that feeling, still apply for them. It is very important. Uh, this will give you, will give you a, a real experience in the field and you will learn a lot. And even if you don't devote yourself to microgravity research, or if you do, this will be very useful to you. Finally, uh, it is very important in, in the space sector and in this field in particular to keep in mind that you work in teams. Okay, so you don't do microgravity research alone because uh, microgravity facilities are expensive and, uh, and the access is very restricted, even still nowadays. So you need to team up and you need to learn how to work in groups. 
and you need to have fun with it because if you don't have fun with it, then what's, what's the point of all of this, right? Uh, I have been very fortunate with all my previous uh, experiences to have a very, uh, very uh, cohesive and, and very well formed teams. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, fun together doing micro reality research and, and having, uh, I don't know what the hell was this, but it was it was so nice that we had to make a picture of it. So uh, don't always keep in mind that uh, you need to learn how to work in groups, you need to know how to create a team and you need to have fun with it. And uh, with this kind of uh, uh, happy conclusion, I, I would like to, to close this presentation and please, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at uh, any of these links or, or even check the presentation that uh, our colleagues at UNOS have uploaded to check for the links and all the, all the papers that we have mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alvaro, for this amazing presentation. Um, thank you for giving us the examples of the many projects you've um, taken part in. I think he's a really good example of really taking part, being proactive in the many opportunities that are out there in the world. Um, as you mentioned, he's um, participated in Drop Your Thesis and um, our UNUS opportunity. So he, he is actually a very good person to talk to maybe if you have any ideas. But thank you so much. I think it's really inspiring and you really gave good advice to everyone. So thank you so much, Alvaro. Thanks to you. OK, now I'd like to move on to the questions and answer part because I see a few questions. So OK, let's start. The first question is from Itamar. Um, I think it's a question slash comment about the actual lead um, experiment that Divya mentioned. So wouldn't the lead shots produced in 1982 um, be drop shaped? instead of perfectly spherical. So Divya, do you have any comments or? Yeah, that, that's a good point. So, so the reason that they need tall towers is to give enough time for the, the drop shape to become a sphere. So uh, in in the free fall, only, there's only surface tension uh, dominating um, uh, the, the, uh, the shape of the droplet. And sp sphere is the minimum surface energy that the droplet can have. So it, it tends to become a sphere. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's why after this first tower, there were taller towers that were made subsequently to, to make sure that you get more sphere spherical droplets and enough cooling time uh, as well. Thank you very much for the clear answer. The next question is also from Itamar. Um, with the many um, space construction and manufacture ideas depending on 3D printing, have you considered the dynamics of 3D printing in a microgravity experiment? Yes, it's it's a very active area of research and there's a lot to be understood there. Uh, and it's very important because 3D printing is being explored as one of the main ways to do manufacturing in space um, because it's uh, you don't need like multiple equipment like, you know, machining equipment, the welding equipment uh, that you need to take to space, which is expensive. Instead, you have a single equipment in space and then you make different structures out of it. Um, yes, droplet dynamics, uh, the way the fluid um, uh, wets the, uh, the, pre the already deposited ma material, the heat transfer characteristics, the cooling characteristics, all of these are still uh, being studied. Uh, there are a few companies that are trying to explore this, uh, but I, I would say there's still a lot of uh, questions that are unanswered there. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, would application of a centripetal force be a viable alternative to magnetized fluid flow in tanks? That's an interesting question. If you read, uh, for instance, uh, Miski's low gravity fluid mechanics works from the 80s, or even Anderson's works from the 60s on, on low gravity liquid explosion, you will see that all of them include the centripetal force term. And mathematically speaking, it is the same as a gravity force. In the fluid mechanic equation, it, it acts basically in the same way. And the, the purpose was to model precisely what happens with a, when a satellite rotates and the fluid goes to the sides. So yeah, it will be feasible, but the problem is that what do you do from a purely systems engineering perspective? Do you rotate a tank inside a spacecraft, like a reaction wheel, or do you rotate a full spacecraft to keep the propeller at the bottom? It, it is just not a feasible alternative because you don't want to move and change your whole design if you have pointing requirements for instance for a sensor or a, or a camera or whatever you put on board you don't want to have that constra constraint in your system so yeah theoretically speaking it is viable but you don't want to rotate the whole thing to make it happen 
So from a systems engineering viewpoint, it is not so interesting. Thank you. Um, Divya, would you want to add something to that? Um, uh, no, I think Alvaro answered it pretty well. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. The next question is from Jorge. Um, his question is to Alvaro. If there is time, could you get the liquid to rotate and use it in the same way than a reaction wheel to get fine point fine pointing accuracy with a satellite? Would it make sense? Well, we will have to crunch the number, but my first thoughts about this are in a reaction wheel, you try to minimize the friction between the wheel and the casing. Because in that way you can you can spend less power in keeping that thing rotating, right? When you have a viscous fluid rotating inside a tank, you have a, a, a large uh, viscous dissipation of the of the kinetic energy of the liquid. So you will have to keep. I mean, theoretically, you could take a magnet, for instance, or a set of electromagnets and start a spinning motion in the liquid. But you will have so much heat dissipation and, and energy dissipation that you will need a lot of power. And my feeling is that if you really need um, high point in accuracy, just buy a small a rotation, a small CMG or a small um, a rotation wheel just to achieve that point in accuracy. And I feel that the current technology for that is much better than whatever we can achieve with rotating liquids. But yeah, it is an interesting question. OK, thank you so much. Um, actually, I don't see any more um, questions at the moment. I think I've cleared all of them. Um, this is the last call. We have the professionals here. So if you'd like to ask something, please make sure to send it now. Um, although I know this was a lot of information for everyone to digest. So everything will be, um, it's on the website. Um, the recordings will be posted there as well. And if you have any more questions that um, you couldn't um, ask now, um, you can also put it in our questionnaire form and we can share it as well. OK, um, I don't see any more, so I guess um, I will close the session now. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Divya and Alvaro, for the amazing presentations. It was a really fantastic overview of what we can do in fluid dynamics. And um, thank you so much to the crowd for um, joining us. And thank you for the people who asked us questions as well. So um, next week, same time, same place, we will have a webinar um, focusing on technology demonstration. So please make sure um, you don't have to register anymore. So please make sure to join us. Um, and this will actually be one of the last webinars that we focus on a specific topic, because after that, we'll be um, getting more general, um, introducing our UNUSA opportunities and bringing in um, space agencies and different um, people to introduce their activities as well. So this is the um, the next one. It will be the last one that will focus on a specific scientific topic. So um, thank you so much. Please make sure to answer our questionnaire before you leave. And yeah, I will see all of you next week, hopefully. So thank you so much to the speakers. Thank you for everyone for joining in. Take care and have a nice day.